listening to The Starting Zone, a podcast about World of Warcraft and the people who play it. And now, here are your hosts. Well, hello and welcome to The Starting Zone, the podcast about World of Warcraft, the people who play it. Today is February 21st, 2023, and my name is Spencer Downey. Thank you so much for listening and subscribing to the podcast. I am joined today, as always, by my co-host Jason Lucas. Jason, how are you doing this fine Tuesday morning? Morning. I'm doing well. Mornings are tough for me. Morning records, man. We'll see if my brain can form complete <laughs> sentences for the next, like, 75 <laughs> minutes here. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. I think odds are pretty good, though. It's pretty late in the morning. You know, I've been... I've been doing stuff with my brain so far today so i think the odds are pretty good it's all warmed up all right it's good you know in the winter you always got to start your car early enough to let it yeah. run for a while it's that kind of thing my brain needs an extra like four to six hours in the morning to <laughs> start functioning and that's only good for like two or three hours before it starts shutting down so yeah, yeah that makes sense I, I i can feel that pain every now and then um yeah i mean uh man it's been uh, it's been a heck of a past week but uh before we dive into anything world of warcraft related do you want to talk a little bit about the abk news Oh boy, I wish I didn't have to. Uh, it was yeah. not a good it was not a good week in no. the uh ABK sphere. Um first of all, uh, the the initial big problem was that uh Blizzard announced a plan for return to office three times a week yeah. starting in April. And as you can imagine, this did not go over very well with the rank and file employees. Um look, it's, you know, like you mentioned, it's 2023. We lived and worked through the worst of the COVID pandemic. COVID is still going on and it is still of concern, especially to, you know, high risk populations and being in an office could potentially result in infections and, you know, uh, bad health outcomes for people that maybe are immunocompromised or have other, other issues. Right. Um, also the quality of life of remote work is, uh, is very important to a lot of people. And Blizzard held the line for a long time with with full remote being an option for most employees um, up until this coming April. And yeah, people are mad about it. And I think rightfully, you know, uh, they, they've shipped a lot of stuff that was made at home. Uh, I know they, they I'm sure they spend a lot of money on on their real estate down there in Irvine, but um, that that's not really I don't I don't know if that's a great justification for this. Um, it's also, I mean, I think part of it is that obviously the the game development industry is very competitive, and there is there are a lot of players in the industry in SoCal, right? Blizzard having full remote on the table for for most employees for this long was very appealing. We we now live in a world where you know, these companies have to make their salary ranges public for various positions. Um, it's a, it's a, it was a law in California that took effect earlier this year, I believe. And Blizzard does not pay particularly competitively. Um, and we've seen this, this, you know, brain drain of Blizzard talent outbound into other studios since, I mean, it really accelerated with the lawsuits in uh, summer of 21. And, you know, part of part of what was attractive and what maybe kept people in place, even if maybe there was a higher money offer on the table or whatever, was being able to work remotely. And they're losing that advantage. They don't have a pay advantage. Maybe years ago they had a prestige advantage, but I feel like that's been flushed down the toilet over the last, you know, three, five, three to five years, something like that. Uh, you know, the, the company released some pretty unpopular products. Their PR image is terrible. Um, obviously, the lawsuit was a disaster. Uh, Bobby Kotick's a disaster. You know, Activision Blizzard management is terrible. It, I don't. I don't really. I, I see this, and what I think is that, like, okay, this is just going to make the games worse. This is going to make people leave the studio. They're not in a position to recruit you know, the, the best possible candidates that are looking for industry jobs because they don't have any advantages over their competitors when it comes to this. They're not offering competitive money. They're not, they're, they don't have a quality of life advantage. Um, so, I mean, in my opinion, this is pretty terrible news and it, it maybe is not a great portent for, you know, the long-term fortunes of the company. 
of course, the stuff can change. As, you know, as, when when the numbers start going down, then maybe you you shift on this because you need you realize you need to hire better people. But then that wasn't bad enough. It was like the next day or two days later. Um, you know, reports came out that there was this all hands Q and A with Mike Ybarra, who's the president of Blizzard. And from all from every report that got out in the press, it was just terrible. You know, it was it was adversarial. Um, Mike sort of diminished the the contributions of QA and customer service, which are very important parts of you know maintaining live service games like the ones that we play, like World of Warcraft. Um, these are you know these are very important disciplines in having functioning products and having happy customers that want to pay you every month. And you know, Mike kind of uh, diminished their their uh, importance to the company and and di- really diminished the disciplines themselves as being like not important career paths. Um, and also made some, frankly, insulting allusions to the fact that like everybody at the company is hurting, including upper management, and they were slashing bonuses and bonuses that people were counting on were being, I forget if it was slashed by 58% or, or they were getting 58% of the bonus that they were, they were supposed to receive. Um, and tried to make some appeals that like, oh, well, this applies to upper management too, and we're all hurting. And it's like, the, the pay scales exist and you know how much upper management is worth and you know what kind of compensation yeah. they get. You yeah. know how much money the company makes. I mean, their investor call was just a couple of weeks ago. Blizzard's making a lot of money. They can afford to pay their people competitively and they can afford to treat them better than this. Um, it just sucks, man. I mean, I've liked Blizzard games since I was a little kid, you know, since Lost Vikings came out for Super Nintendo. I liked all their games. And the, the place always seemed to have a, a dedication to the craft and the art of making video games that I thought made their products special. And I think probably a lot of people felt that way. And that's why they were attracted to the products. And you read stuff like this. And I mean, I'm a grown man, obviously I'm in my forties. I've, I've worked my whole life, right? I've, I've worked in various industries and I, I can kind of read the writing on the wall here. Why would you want to work for this company? They don't, they don't appreciate their rank and file employees. They don't pay them competitively. They don't give them decent quality of life. They just take advantage of them. And eventually that means your products are going to suffer. And, you know, they're in a spot right now where I think Dragonflight is really good. I think it's it was been a pretty good year for stuff like Hearthstone. You know, Diablo 4 is shaping up. They're still doing stuff with Diablo 3. I mean, the games are still in a pretty good spot. But how long can you keep behaving this way from a management perspective and continue to attract the talent you need to keep the games at a high level? And it's just like... A person with life experience and and uh, and somebody who has you know played the games and stuff. I just I can't I can't imagine that it's that's an easy sell to try to get like high quality talent in to work on these games anymore. Yeah, I mean it's a definitely a competitive market inside that area of the world, like in California, especially inside the Irvine area. I mean you have Riot right there as well, who's working on like six or seven different game projects at the moment. Um, and it's another employer and I don't know necessarily what their <clears throat> support is for return to work or any sort of, uh, you know, accommodation that needs to happen as far as people working from home. But I do know that they're another employer that a lot of people that I know who worked at Blizzard went to go work at because they preferred to work there because they felt it was a better environment for them. Um, and I've been to Riot campus several times and it's a great campus and, you know, it's, it's a really fun space to be in. And I've been to Blizzard campus several times and it's not as nice. I'm just putting it out there. It just isn't. Um, it's much more like an office building. Uh, and they have definitely their own wings where they put in art and, you know, you'll walk into what looks like, uh, like, I don't know, a, a generic office building. And then suddenly there's a giant orc statue or something there. And you're like, well, that's really cool. But then the rest of it is still just an office space, right? It's not, there's nothing dynamic or super interesting about it. Um, so I think mixing it up is something that a lot of people do for a lot of reasons. And and one of them happens to be uh, <laughs> that Blizzard is really bad at internal promotion. They're really bad at it. They need to very much improve the perspective of their company that if you want to move up in their company, you have to leave Blizzard, go and work someone else somewhere else for a period of time, and then get rehired into a higher position. That's something that's been happening for years, like decades. Uh, so I, it's, it's, it's a struggle for me when it sounds like they're devaluing the people that are so critical to the company and they're trying to use the excuses of we're all hurting when you know that these are people who are making substantially more money. Um, in some cases, 10 to 12 times more money per hour than the person who you're talking to. Uh, <laughs> you, you, 
it's a very different perspective that clearly that person doesn't share, right? And it, it, it makes you seem very tone deaf and out of touch with what's happening with the actual rank and file employee. Um, so you have to be very careful inside any kind of management or leadership position when you attempt to like make it seem as though you're all in this together and we're all in the same experience. It's not, that's not what's happening, right? Like you, you drop your, your salary down for, you know, a couple of years to what a CA person makes, uh, or sorry, a CS person makes, and then we'll see what actually, you know, happens with your life, how you're feeling about things. Could you still afford your house payments? Could you still afford to, you know, drive to work in the car you do? Could you still afford to feel as though you could actually take time off from work to take a vacation or to take a break or to do whatever it is, right? There's a, there's a lot of things that people struggle with when it comes to paying their bills and just living their life, especially inside California of all places. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I, I feel for, for the, the employees there that are going through this. Uh, as someone who prefers to work from home, but very rarely ever gets to do it, uh, this sucks. <laughs> um, because I hate having to go into the office regularly. Uh, and to hear that they released how many successful products and World of Warcraft being in a really great state at the moment and Diablo 4 about to launch and it's incredibly anticipated and all this work happened remotely to then go, we want you back in the office three days a week. What, what do you... what? what is driving this change, right? And that's what I'd really need to know as an employee is what is driving this push, this change to bring people back into the office? Is it just a, a mentality of the industry that so, you know, somehow work is done better that way? Or, you know, what, what is the motivation here to, to force that to happen? Because you're not just talking about, you know, hey, people have to be back in the office. It's people have to pay for gas. People need vehicles to get there. People are now committing time outside of work hours to, to commute. You know, in some cases, people are driving an hour to an hour and a half a day each direction. So three hours of their day is now gone because you made this choice. And that's okay. So nine hours of their week is gone because they have to be in the office three days a week. Like that's their, that's their lives that you're taking away in that situation. So, you know, this is, it's a big deal. It's a bigger deal than a lot of people think it is. So I, I do hope that there's some reversal that happens on this based off of backlash, but you never know really. All right, let's move into some World of Warcraft. Okay. So, Jason, what did you get up to this past week in WoW? So, uh, it was kind of a busy week, all things considered. Uh, we did lose a raid night to Valentine's Day, um, which was not unexpected, but it's just kind of the way it turned out. It kind of it kind of sucked because we had, uh, um, you know, the Super Bowl uh, last week and then into Valentine's Day. Um, so, that, that really disrupted the schedule a lot, just the way, it, you know, that stuff falls with our raid nights and with timing, with stuff... Um, you know, still pretty fresh, right? Sometimes this time of year we're deep in something and it doesn't really matter, but that's not the case right now. Uh, so what I ended up doing, uh, my my wife coincidentally was out of town um, on, on business last week. So I was home alone. Uh, I ended up just doing keys with some of my friends that were around. So just, did, you know, caught up on keys for the week, which was nice. Get like four keys in in a session, get halfway done with the vault and got uh, Shadow Moon Barrel Grounds Teleport unlocked. Got up to plus 20 on that, so that's awesome. I uh, got rating up to 2545, finished the week at, which is pretty nice. And at 2500, you get the Keystone Hero achievement. That gives you this kind of cryptic item. And I, I wasn't sure what it did at first. You get this item in your mailbox. It's like a cosmetic item, and it unlocks additional appearances for certain set items. And it's, it's cool, but it's a little funny because... I'm wearing the mythic warrior set appearance on head and shoulders. And it's, it looks kind of like stone, like it's carved stone and it has this like lightning shooting out of it, which is pretty cool. It's got these like this crackling, like white lightning on the shoulders and these like bolts shooting out of the, the top of the helmet. Um, this item actually unlocks appearances that shut the lightning off on the mythic set. <laughs> now the cool thing is it turns the lightning on, on the LFR normal and heroic, appearances and some of those look really cool because they have different you know they have different colors and stuff so the heroic one is like this this bright blue and the um the normal one's uh yellow so it's cool to have those extra appearances for those sets but it, it was kind of funny that for the one i'm using it just shut the the glow effect off but yeah if you get 2500 rating you get that item and you're like what the heck does this thing do check your you know use it log out log back in and check your helm and shoulder appearances for your your set items um, so the other thing, the other big thing this week was Razageth. All we did, all we did for raid Wednesday and Sunday was Razageth. Uh, I had one boss kill for the week, so I didn't even get a raid choice out of my vault. 
<laughs> um, Wednesday was actually pretty awful. We talked on Tuesday, and that was right after nerfs had come in. And Razageth got nerfed kind of significantly, I would say, especially for like a first real nerf pass on Heroic. Like it was pretty big, 5% health, and a bunch of abilities got tuned way down. Um, our best healer was not around on Wednesday and the group does suffer when he's not around. And it's not really fair to him because he needs to have a life outside of the game, but it, it's just the state of being right now. I don't have healers that can pick up his slack at the moment. Um, I think people came in unfocused and they expected it to be really easy because of the nerfs, like easier than it actually was. And plus we had that weird layover where we missed two consecutive raid nights. And I think people were just checked out. We just died in Raz for two straight hours and, we didn't get significantly farther. Like we got a little bit farther than our best attempts, but not a lot. And it was a bit frustrating, but we also had some people who were just dead, you know, they, like an, a, a, a mechanic would go out and they would just die or, or they would die like multiple times in a pool, you know, uh, with B reses and everything. And it's like, I, we can't afford to carry people for ahead of the curve prog. It's just not, it's not in the cards right now. So I looked at the logs and, you know, I, I tried to, I tried to balance out a group that would be successful. I cut it down to like 16 roster invites. Well, I guess 15 with me, um, ended up bringing a couple extra people who were like very competent players and who can handle mechanics and stuff. So it was like 18, I think was the final group size or maybe 17. Um, I think it was 17. And it was still mostly pretty tough. I mean, we weren't we weren't slamming pulls. There's a lot of downtime. Again, like uh, kind of lack of focus. Sometimes we were like accidentally tagging the boss with stuff pre pull, and then everybody's got to jump off and reset, and that takes a bunch of time. Um, that that to me, that stuff just smacks of like just not being mentally prepared to work on the fight, and it is frustrating as the raid leader, but. The good news is we we were dying to the hard parts for the most part. Like once the pool got going, we were we were doing really well with with the early parts. And um, unfortunately, it took all night, but we did get to kill. So ahead of the curve is done. Hey, congratulations! Uh, yeah, thanks. It feels really nice. Uh, I'm glad we got it done. And I think this is going to be one of those fights that isn't too bad to reclear on a weekly basis because it doesn't punish you for killing stuff fast. This is not like Denathrius or something where. You know, you have to hold DPS or something. You need to like hit these very specific thresholds or else you get punished. So that, you know, that should be good. I mean, I think our goal is going to be to re-clear it uh, for a few more weeks, see if we can hopefully cycle some more people in for ahead of the curve and stuff. Um, and then, you know, we also want to work on, you know, Mythic Taros, I guess, is the next prog target. So as long as I have the attendance, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep trying to prog bosses. Uh, so that'll be cool. But yeah, overall, I mean, I, I think Raz is, a really good end, end raid boss, like maybe the best end boss we've had since, I don't know, Cahoon maybe. And I, I, that I didn't really like Cahoon that much. So that's not like a huge endorsement coming from me, but it, it just, it, the fight felt good to prog. It felt like it taught you what you needed to know as you went through and each individual thing you have to learn kind of, it fits the theme of the fight and it builds on itself to some degree. So I think all told it was like our 45th pull was a kill, but we did have some pulls that like weren't actually pulls there, you know, from tagging the boss and whatever. So in the, you know, 40 ish pulls is about, that's about average. I think for us for ahead of the curve kill, maybe, maybe a little on the low side, but I'll take it. You know, that's kind of what I wanted for this tier. Um, and yeah, outside of rate, I did, I did do a little bit more outdoor stuff last week than I had been. Um, I, uh, the big thing that I did was, I did some primal storms and I grinded out a, uh, a chess piece for my monk. And I, I got that, you know, up to 385 and, and catalyzed it. So I got my two piece bonus on the monk. And I also got like a 389 weapon out of the time walking box on him. So I got a couple nice upgrades on the monk last week. He's still not, I, I mean, he's at the point now where if I took him to a normal raid, I wouldn't be embarrassed because he's like 376 or something, which is low, but I wouldn't, that would be like the lowest I would take somebody to my own raid, right? So at least I don't have to, I wouldn't have to bend the rules for my own tune if I wanted to bring them to normal at this point, I guess is what I'm saying. So yeah, even with the, you know, even even with only two nights of raid, like it was definitely a pretty busy week in game for me compared to maybe how some of the last few weeks have been. Oh, well, good to hear. I played a little bit of WoW myself this past week. Um, just working on reputations, that sort of stuff outside. But one of the things I did for reputations was the uh, Uldaman Legacy of Tear Dungeon. 
um, which is hilarious because I random queued into it, uh, which of course got me in his resto. And I hadn't healed a lot on resto. I've pretty much just been doing outdoor stuff, so I've been doing a lot of Umkin stuff. But the first thing the person says is just like, I'm just going to like run through this place. And I was like, okay, we'll just see how that goes. Let's see if my muscle memory remembers how to do this well enough. And uh, it got spicy. Like they were, they were basically running from boss to boss to boss, pulling all of the, just dragging all of the trash with them as people sort of start, started AOEing. So there was definitely some spicy moments, but it was a good time. And it was one of those things that I think it took us a total of like 12 minutes to do a legacy of the year or something right. that's a pretty big dungeon i mean like <laughs> it it's is. five bosses it's just geographically large yeah. and there's a lot of trash in there so yeah that uh, whoever was tanking that was motoring for sure they were yeah they were they were definitely moving uh through that whole place so it was yeah it was crazy because i was i i literally was waiting on a friend to uh finish something up so i could meet up with them i was like well i'll just i'll queue into this you know quickly and if it takes them 30 minutes then whatever they'll wait on me for five minutes or something right yeah, it took us like 12 and then i was waiting around for the friend afterwards it's like this is right. weird like this took so fast um so that was fun uh going through that again and healing something that was that aggressive and it definitely gives me the a little bit of an itch to do some m plus so i'll start digging into that at some point i'm sure but uh that was a really good time um the other thing that's sort of wow uh associated or side side attached was uh I was up in uh, up visiting Sloot this past weekend uh, as part of his birthday celebrations, and so I was up there and hung out with Josh, who's Devil Lore, uh, used to be the, uh, one of the big community manager people over at Blizzard for a while, um, as well as uh, some other friends that we have up there uh, who we refer to as the Bruvs uh, that we all sort of hang out with. Had a really good time uh, spending some time with them on Sunday. Um, it was a bit of a drive for me to get there and a bit of a drive to get back, and I, of course, had to be back in time for doing stuff today, so... I mean, I was only up for the day, but it was a really good time. And if you guys haven't swung by Salute Stream the past couple of days, then you've missed out on some pretty good shenanigans that have been going on while people are up from California visiting. So, yeah, it's a good time. I'm, I'm just glad to spend That's awesome. some time with the friends. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. It's been, you know, it's been such a weird, it's a rough few years with, yeah. um, with the pandemic and everything. And, you know, normally the only time we see anybody in this sphere is at BlizzCons, which haven't been happening. So it's it's cool you got a chance to do that. I miss those guys. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm I'm looking forward to there being a BlizzCon thing later this year, hopefully, and we can have more meetups. Uh, because it's really nice to see them and I miss the guys. I miss the guys. So it was a good time. It was worth the drive. Uh all right, with that though, let's hop into what's going on this week in World of Warcraft. All right, so this week is the Arena Skirmish bonus event. So obviously, if you get 10 Arena, arena, arena Skirmishes, uh, arena skirmishes wins, uh, you will get uh, a quest reward for Conquest and Honor. You can pick up the quest inside of Valdraken. Uh, and um, that is, yeah, it's Valdraken. Oh my goodness. I thought for a second there I said the word wrong. I got I tripped myself up with the, the Arena Skirmishes. Yeah, that I was you're, doing. yeah, yeah. I you're just, back on track. Threw it off. Anyways, uh, it also means the sign of the skirmisher buff is up, where the honor gains from arena skirmishes are increased by fifty percent. Uh, there's also the aiding the accord, siege of Dragon Bank Keep, community feast, Shakar hunting grounds, primal storms, cobalt assembly rep, obsidian rep, and your weekly profession and consortium uh, quests to do. That's that nice big list that you do. Um, so be sure you're taking care of those. Uh, the reason why I ran that legacy of tier last week is because it was the double dungeon quest last week. So I got that extra reputation reward this week. It's Ruby Life Pools and uh, Naltharius. So be sure you are taking advantage of those dungeons while you can. Uh, PvP quests are random BGs and raided arenas. And of course, there's the war mode Sparks of Life quest you can do in the Onar, Onar and Plains. So take advantage of those if you'd like. Uh, as far as the PvP brawl goes, it's packed house. This means that, you know, basically you are taking on an arena match with 15 players against 15 players. So you go into an arena that's built for two to three, you know, teams of twos or teams of threes, and it's 15s against 15s. So it's shenanigans. It's crazy. It's wild. They're super fast. If you're looking for something to get really fast honor, it's a great way to do it. Um, obviously, if you win, you get the something different quest completion, uh, which you'll get when you queue up into the, the uh, brawl itself. Um, which gets you marks of honor, conquest, and honor. So if you're looking for like a really fast way to just gain a bunch of honor, uh, Packed House is a great way to do that <laughs> because you'll get a bunch of kills and they go really fast and there's a 50-50 you know, chance you win. Like it really is a 50-50 chance you win. There isn't like a super secret strat that you do when you randomly queue in with 15 people against another group of randomly right. queued in 15 people. Yeah. 
No. Yeah, there's not a lot of technique here. Last week was classic Ashran was the brawl. Yeah. I I there yeah. I think it went South Shore Terran Mill and then classic Ashran and then Packed House. And like one of those things is not like the other. Yes. Um yeah, these games are super quick and they're kind of hilarious actually because everything just explodes. So the other thing too is Conquest is uncapped now, right as of yep. last week. So we got, you know, arena skirmishes and packed house. Like you can get that's like what 175 conk or something just right there just from completing those two things in addition to whatever else you might be doing so that's pretty nice i mean th- yeah these games are going to be super fast and um it's pretty funny i i think i mean i haven't done this in a while but i always got a kick out of it when i when i would do it because yeah you got 30 people in the tiny little arena map and the timer goes and then everybody just dies and then you yeah. queue up another one yeah yep yeah, that's basically it uh, as a healer queuing into those, it's kind of hilarious because you're just spam healing one or two people because you can't actually keep track of everyone else who's taking damage. It is just so much damage going out against so many people so quickly. Uh, and people's gear varies so much that, you're just, yeah, it's it's insanity. It's a good time. I enjoy it. Uh, all right. World boss is Bazu- <laughs> Bazuol, the Dreaded Flame, the big fire proto-dragon in Azure Span. Drop some 395 loot with your uh, wrist, plate wrist, male feet, leather waist, cloth chest, and a heavy haste ring with crit. Uh, plus, affixes for the week are fortified, raging, and quaking, meaning non boss enemies have more health and inflict increased damage. When, uh, sorry, when non boss enemies drop below 30% health, they deal 50% increased damage until defeated. And periodically, all players emit a shockwave, inflicting damage and interrupting nearby allies. So. <sighs> Raging, Quaking, Fortified. Fortified Raging is not nice because they are very symbiotic, where because mobs have more health and they're already doing more damage, when they drop below 30% health, which they'll do at a higher health total because they have more health overall, so their percentage of 30% is higher than where it normally would be, they then do even more damage. Uh, So Trash is going to be spicy. Um, You can dispel raging effects, which is really nice. So for those really large enemies or enemies that do large AoEs, this is critical that you, you know, have someone in there who's dispelling these things on higher keystones for Mythic Plus. Um, But also having mobs hit that 30% together and AoEing them down is great as long as your tank knows it's coming and can get away or can do big stuns, those sorts of things to interrupt mobs uh, so that you give your tank a chance to not just get one shot by all the, these attacking mobs when they suddenly start doing 50% increased damage. Quaking is quaking. It requires spacing. You got to watch your spell casts. It's not a huge deal for a lot of players to deal with. Um, I love, and I will always reiterate this, that they finally made it so you can just sit and eat or drink without being interrupted or stood up every time quaking happens. And I love that they've been going through and finding all of the issues of anything that's any sort of transportation or knockback inside of a uh, uh, dungeon, a Mythic Plus dungeon, not having Quaking overlapping with it to just one-shot your entire group. So Quaking, to me, I think is in a good place. I don't think it really affects this particular week in a big way than any other way than it normally affects a week. But Fortified Raging is going to make Fortified a more spicy week than it normally would be. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty spot on. Uh, yeah, your tank definitely needs to be prepared for when raging starts happening. Um, the good thing, there's a couple good things, I guess, about Fort Raging compared to like Fort Weeks with other low health or on death effects. I guess there really aren't any other low health effects, right? Everything else is kind of on death. Like bolstering is kind of worse than raging, right? In terms of how much time it costs you, assuming your tank is alive. Bursting is um, worse. Yeah. Yeah, bursting, bursting is certainly worse. Um, uh, the what's whatever the ghosts is called i can't think of right now but th- that's uh, that's worse because it slows you down so much as the ghosts pop and you have to keep sliding around and repositioning or dpsing them down like raging isn't a buff that the mob applies to the mobs around it so you can like chain pull if you have you know a couple low health mobs you can just move on you know you, you got the stationary mobs killed or whatever then you can you can keep moving um and yeah, there's also plenty of counterplay because if you got druids, hunters, rogues, you can just dispel the enrage and then they're back to normal. Um, you can also, if there's something that's particularly dangerous, you can just single target it down and kill it. And, you know, again, it doesn't, it's not a buff that applies to anything around it. It doesn't buff friendlies or whatever. So just kill it. Um, that's definitely a, a viable strategy this week. So yeah. overall, I think it's, it's not bad. Like quaking, 
man, last time quaking rolled around that, that first couple, the first couple nights was actually pretty terrible because we hadn't seen it in, you know, what, seven weeks or eight weeks. And, and everybody was pushing into higher and higher keys by, by that point. Cause this is, we're back around to the first rotation, I think now for mythic plus, cause it's only a, a 10 week rotation this season. And there were all kinds of weird interactions with quaking on certain bosses and in certain dungeons that were just not, they weren't fair, frankly, you know, like you would get it on inhale on the worm boss and shadow and burial grounds. And everybody has to be stacked in these like six yard circles and you have an eight yard circle around all five players. What are you supposed to do? And that night, the answer was, well, you're supposed to die when the quaking explodes on the group that's in the corpse pile, right? <laughs> like, that's just how that worked. But they hot fix that stuff out. So I think they've they've shaved down some of the sharper edges on quaking this season, which is good. Um, quaking does have some pretty nasty counterplay with thundering, which is kind of the problem, I think. that That's actually the hardest part, I think, that Quaking presents this season is because Thundering requires two players to be in very close proximity to clear the effect. Quaking can interrupt that. Um, so, you, I mean, you have to be careful. If you're, if you're trying to do serious keys, like you should have a weak aura that makes it obvious to your group which mark you have and how, you know, how long you have it for. Like, I have one that, I mean, obviously, I have negative every time, right? Because I play tank spec. So I always have the red X, but it spams that red X over and over again and then starts counting down when I get into the last five seconds. So you could tell when, like, okay, this has to get cleared now. You need a tool like that to really keep track of it in the game field so that you can, you know, properly assess, like, okay, what's going to pop first or whatever if it right. comes down to that? Because, um, yeah, you don't you don't really want to hit I mean, I guess if you got to pick one, quaking is probably not as bad because it doesn't stun you, versus you know, letter letting the thundering go off. That that stun can just be that that can easily result in death. So that's the main thing I think this week that is gonna maybe trip you up is managing other mechanics around the quaking thundering combo. But yeah, bring uh, rogues, dru druids, and hunters, and and get those enrages off, and then you basically have, you know a fort dungeon with uh with just quaking yeah and that's yeah. not that's not too bad so i think it's gonna be a good week I'm, I'm hoping i can get at least like if i can get like one portal a week at this point then i'm pretty happy but if the keys line up this week maybe with this combo i could get more than one i, I would love to get my teleports done soon yeah if you run over top of someone and stun them with thundering because you're a little bit late they might be particularly spiteful against you later on uh <laughs> that's what it is that's what it those is those are the ghosts yep, they should just call it ghosts, ghosts. <laughs> it's ghosts it's just called yeah. ghosts why do they call it quaking it should just be brown circles yeah right <laughs> that's what i mean that's what i say right if somebody yeah. in guild's like oh what are the ethics this week i'm like uh ghosts they're like oh no not the ghosts mm, it's true it's true all right uh micro holiday wise we got hatching the hippogriffs that's kicking off on thursday be sure to pay attention to that that's only on thursday so you want to be sure that you are Hopping on in the 23rd, heading out to Feralis, helping incubate an egg to get your uh, Fray Feather Hatchling companion who's going to ride around your shoulders for five days, sorry, for a, a day. But if you actually take that, once you've completed the Hatchling, and go over to Lorthalium, uh, you can essentially defeat Lorthalium and get that extension up to five days, and then you can roll around for five days with a cute little hippogriff on your shoulder, which is adorable. Just don't go into PvP or you'll lose it, because, you know, do all your PvP first. The PvP first. Right, yeah, true. Have that all wrapped up by, yeah. you know, end of day Thursday and then yeah. go do this. Because, yeah, that will clear all your buffs and stuff, including this. Uh, yeah. This is one of my favorites because hippogriffs are so cool. And, yeah. uh, who doesn't want a little baby hippogriff hanging out with you all week? And it this takes, like, no time at all. It takes much longer to get out to, to Feralus and, yes. than it does to hatch the egg and defeat the uh, Lorthalium and, you know, have your, have your buddy. Yeah. So I forgot to do this last year, I think. I got to remember to do it this year because... Um, yeah, I'm in my Night Elf main. I gotta have my Hippogriff Hatchling. Yeah. And if you're a Druid, don't forget you can Dreamwalk to Feralus, because we cheat, because we're Druids. So, just keep that in mind. True, um, cheater class strikes again. <laughs> Alright, hot fix wise uh, they fixed an issue preventing uh, the root from Void Tendrils from being removed when Void Tendrils died. Um, yeah, if I get rooted by something and I kill the thing that rooted me, I'd really be nice if its magical effects wore off. So, uh, I, you know, appreciate that, because no one wants to be rooted for longer than they have to be. It's not fun. 
Um, so they uh, they were changed that for priests. So priests, guess what? Stuff that you're rooting will not be rooted as long if they kill the tendrils. Just keep that in mind. Uh, for uh, Mythic Plus, inside Halls of Valor, uh, the Eye of Storm no longer damages pets. So that ability when it's being cast no longer damages pets. This is something they've sort of been going through is going through all the Mythic Plus dungeons and making sure pets live to more abilities. Um, this is a really nice thing because I have known many a hunter or Warlock, who has gotten to the last boss of a Mythic Plus dungeon and realized the reason why they're doing such bad damage up to that point is because their pet died far earlier in the dungeon and they completely forgot about <laughs> it and didn't realize it. Yeah, Right. Yeah. It's usually Warlock, to be fair, and it kind of makes sense because they have a lot going on. It's definitely never your Beast Mastery Hunter because your Beast Mastery Hunter will never stop talking about the status of their pet. So right. that's right. you know that's how you know the difference. But um, <laughs> uh, Hersha has been one of the, I think, more challenging bosses overall in the pool um because just the mechanics are extremely punishing right hersia does a lot of damage the eye of the storm does a lot of damage the the radiating light thing does a lot of damage the beam that shoots a tank from one end to the other that that does a ton of damage so everything will kill you i mean i had to rework the visuals on her light side buff because it was too hard to dodge so you know it's obviously things been touched up a lot and um you know, Eye of the Storm shouldn't be damaging pets because you can't control what they're doing. And if they're going to be behind the target munching on it while a giant AoE is going out, then they can't die to that because you have no control over that. So this is a good fix. It should make Hersha a lot easier to do for uh, Hunter and, and Warlock groups, which is great. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't have a lot of experience so far this season with like high tyrannical halls. I haven't really started looking at that one yet. It just hasn't come around as like a desirable key partially because the dungeon's so long. But um, I have noticed they've made a lot of changes to the bosses and, and Hersha especially. Uh, another hot fix that came out was an issue with PvP items where some of them had the incorrect item level and were missing the eligibility for socketing. Um, so this is a fix that has gone in and they actually are making it retroactive, which means if you already have the items, you just have to re-log and then this would actually be resolved for you. So if your PvP gear got shifted around a bit item level wise or if you weren't able to put a socket on something you think you should have been able to time to try again because you should be able to put a socket on it so that should be good uh it's nice when they fix things like this so you can feel as powerful as you should and you're not confused as to why one of your pieces of gear is a different item level than all of the other ones that you picked up from pvp uh yeah that's a strange thing when that happens but yeah it's nice that they were able to make this retroactive you know especially with like socket eligibility and stuff like that because Reacquisition is the thing that feels the worst, I think, in this game always. Um, and they're in kind of a better spot for that, I think, going forward because they, they're they out in front from the beginning with Dragonflight when it comes to what pieces are socketable and how you get the sockets and everything like that. And also in PvE, we have sort of the rotating dungeon pool. So like in Season 2, you're going to want a different slate of items than you did from season one anyway. So that kind of helps with, with the, uh, you know, the reacquisition frustration. And so it, it's great when they're able to update loot that you already have versus going, Hey, this has changed. Go get another one. Yeah. Yeah. It's that it always feels bad. Every season rollover last, you know, back in, uh, back in, uh, uh, Shadowlands felt really bad for that exact reason. The amount of times I had to get a cube was ridiculous as far as trinkets go. Um, so I was very happy that uh, they're doing things like this retroactive more more now. All right, 10.0.7, uh, I got some, some hotfix notes and some development notes, I guess, is the big thing that they were. Um, and the first one's not super exciting. Basically, you know, Forbidden Reach is now available for testing, which is good, so people can go out and test Forbidden Reach. Uh, but the treasure vaults are now only on their one their weekly timer as opposed to daily. So if you're someone who was testing the crap out of treasure vaults because you really enjoyed them, you now can only really do it every week, which is a little bit sad because I think keeping it daily was smart during testing to allow people to test it more. But anyways, uh, it's it's going. It, what it does tell us is that it's going to be on a weekly timer, so we know that it's a once a week event that you're going to be able to do with Treasure Vaults. The more exciting news, the stuff that I'm kind of excited to read about, is the Winterpelt Fulberg faction. Um, the Furbergs are, have always been a really cool race inside World of Warcraft that I've always enjoyed sort of hanging around with, these like Wolverine people um, that sort of run around. And what we're learning about them is they speak their own language, uh, which no one seems to understand. And through doing activities with them, you will slowly and eventually learn to speak their language. 
uh, which I think is wicked as a concept. Um, the amount of times there's been other factions who speak a language and you just innately know it, uh, or everyone speaks common tongue, if you will, right? I feel like is missing out on opportunities to have, you know, a learned character who spent the time researching and learning how to speak other languages to actually be able to, to talk and interact with these races. And it's a really neat way to, inter to introduce a new faction into the, into the game by having people actually go to it, sort of work to assist them, and then figure out their language through working with them. I think that's actually a really cool concept. So uh, to start the academic assistance, which is the quest for doing this, um, you can accept it in your adventure guide, which I think is a great way that they're doing things now, where you just go in your adventure guide and accept quests. Uh, and you'll, it will become available after you complete um, the Rust Pine Den quest chains in Azure Span. So uh, once you've completed that, you'll be able to get the academic assistance. You'll then start to learn their language uh, and you can track your progress learning their language inside your spellbook. So I don't quite know exactly how that's going to work and what that's going to look like because it's a weird place to track things. Um, I also don't open my spellbook all that often. So I guess I'll just be checking it. I'm surprised they didn't go to like change up the profession area and like rename it something different and add like an area for languages um, and just have like a, you know, in that sort of panel frame. But anyways, it'll be in your spell book and we'll see what that looks like later uh, in 10.0.7. So uh, it's cool. I, I just like the idea of having a faction. I like that they're Fulbergs and I like that you'll learn their language through doing tasks with them. Yeah, it's been, uh, you know, it's been a minute since we had a, a Furbolg uh, a rep grind. Mm -hmm. um, like by a minute, I mean like, I don't know, 18 years or something. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Um, but yeah, I, I thought that was their story. Like as you kind of encounter the different, you know, characters in, in Azure span, I thought was, was really neat. And it seemed like it was building towards something else to do that kind of never happened. And I think there's even, even right now, I think there's like a rep bar in your, your rep tab that like doesn't move yet. So um, it's, it's been this sort of little mystery that we're waiting to, to hear more about. So yeah, this is cool. And they, they did some, some interesting stuff with learning a language in, 9.2 right with uh, uncovering the the language in Zareth Mortis and you know initially different text in game would just be these symbols that you couldn't decipher and then you know you would learn you gain some new knowledge and then you could read some of it and then it would unlock different stuff in the uh you know in the zone I don't know if this is going to have that overarching of an effect around your outdoor gameplay but i i like the idea of it and i, I think they showed in in zareth mortis that they can do some interesting storytelling with that kind of you know uncovering mastering a, a new language kind of thing with with gameplay so i'm i'm excited about it I, I think it's 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 very like classic warcraft flavor right to have the the furbolgs involved and you have to try to form this bond with them right like that that's a total throwback um yeah and it, I think it fits, you know, the the overall theme of that zone too. So I'm I'm interested in it. This is definitely something that I'll I'll check out and, and work on when the patch comes out. Yeah, we also saw some balance changes coming through to a bunch of classes. Obviously, none of this is live yet or going to be live in the next two weeks or anything. So you don't have to worry yourself too much about that, unless you're someone who's actively doing testing and trying to sort out, you know, by giving active feedback uh, on a regular basis to the devs about you know how something feels. You wouldn't have to worry too much about these changes yet. However, they did some changes to Balance Druid and to Restoration Druid that I wanted to mention. Um, for Balance, they are now making it so that Stellar Flare has an effect that if it's dispelled, it actually does damage to the person who dispelled it. Um, this is something that Warlocks have had forever, which is a way of, even Shadow Priest, a, a way of sort of protecting their dots on targets since that's their primary way of doing damage in a lot of cases. Um, I mean, Warlocks with Chaos Bolt was kind of a ridiculous scene to also you know, have abilities for things like that. Anyways, um, what happens with druids now is because the majority of their damage is now based around do dots with Moonfire, Sunfire, and Stellar Flare, they're making it so that you know if you're dispelling balanced druid dots consistently and regularly on a target, you're actually taking a hit for it. So uh, I'm excited to see how that plays out in PvP. I'm actually might watch some AWC once this change goes live to see if balanced druids start sneaking in there at all because it's a large enough change that it can surprise people, depending on how much that hit is that people are taking for dispelling the dots. Um, it, it makes druids feel less useless in those sorts of PvP matches, and we, we've seen some, uh, you know, KFC balanced druid stuff happening in uh, in PvP every now and then, but it's not very consistent, and it's just such a fun class to watch that 
I'd love to see a little bit more of that inside PvP stuff. The other change that we got was for Restoration. Um, they'd announced previously that Natural Wisdom, the actual talent that you have, uh, was going to become Baseline, uh, which means they were going to change up the Restoration Druid talent tree, and then they chose to revert this change. Um, when they were going to make a Baseline, it was actually also going to nerf the spell so that it no longer gave you a natural passive regeneration. It also made the um, Innervate effect only 50% versus 100% as far as the uh, the mana cost reduction, so it was a, a very weak version of inter of uh, Innervate that you were going to get. So then reverting this is nice for Restoration Druids who actually want the talent there. Clearly this came from feedback and testing. So just wanted to let people know that that took place as a thing. Was there any other classes you wanted to highlight, Jason, before we moved in? Well, I mean, I think the big story of so far, and I guess by now we would know about it if there's going to be a bigger one, but the big story of 10.0.7 of PTR class stuff is Paladin. Paladin is, uh, you know, it's a new class. Yeah. It's just becoming a new class. Um, Holy is seeing some reworks. Um, Prot is seeing many reworks. Retribution is a brand new spec, essentially. Um, these are massive, massive changes to the class tree and the ret tree. And Holy and Prot also have many associated changes as a result. Um, and it's exciting. I mean, I know a lot of people that are really excited about it. Uh, I do feel like Rhett Paladin in particular has been getting very moldy over the years. Um, and so it was probably time to touch it up quite a bit. Um, it's weird that it didn't make it for Dragonflight launch, but this is kind of what happens sometimes. And I mean, they have, I mean, they, they feel like they have the tools to do it now, right? With the talent, the way the classes are built and the way the talents are set up. And this is the kind of thing, man, we would never, ever see this in like a dot five or a dot seven patch in previous no, versions agreed. of the game. Yeah. Like maybe yeah. you would see it in like a dot two patch if something was dire, yeah. but they would never change a class this much midstream. But I, I think they feel like now they have all this flexibility, they have the framework to do it, and there's no punishment to the player other than, you know, building out a talent spec. There's no opportunity cost for the player. You don't have to do anything. You just log in and set your talent. So I think it's emboldened them to do it a bit. Um, so far, I haven't heard a lot of complaints or pushback that like they are changing stuff too much. I do think that there's a danger that they run with just like rebuilding and reworking these classes and specs like in not even like a new version patch. Um but I don't think we're there yet. I mean, I think I think the player base is is hungry for frequent updates and for for frequent puzzles to solve and synergies to unlock and stuff. Um, so I guess you know we'll we'll see how this all turns out. I mean, there, there's a lot of other reworks and and a lot of other bug fixes and stuff coming in with this patch, but the paladin changes are are just massive. I mean, I, I can't speak to them intelligently because I haven't played paladin at all this expansion so far, so I don't even really know what they do currently. I do know that when I initially built out my Paladin in the pre-patch, I was like, well, this is pretty boring. This is kind of standard, like, okay, this is the same stuff Paladin has had forever, and I'm not even really coming up with any cool combos that feel good to have. That was my that was just sort of my gut punch reaction to like setting up prop paladin in 10.0 pre-patch. Um and so yeah, I I think, you know, I think it was time. And the stuff that probably just couldn't make it in under the wire for Dragonflight to launch, but Obviously, it's something they felt like needed to happen. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, th I think a lot of Paladin mains would probably agree. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited that this is happening in a .0.7 patch as opposed to a .5 or a you know actual .0 patch that comes out. Um, when we were doing Shadowlands, there was you know a huge period of time where Shadow Priests were in a really bad state. Shamans had a couple of broken specs that no one wanted to play just because of how underpowered they were. And they sat in those states for so long until finally a .o patch happened that did something about one of them. Uh, and it's really unfortunate when that happens. So I'm glad to see that, you know, as you said, sort of things that got missed or didn't actually get addressed well before the actual expansion launched are actually happening in an earlier patch as opposed to waiting for one of those major ones to happen. I think it's gonna be a great experience for a lot of players. And I, uh, the other thing I guess that's really exciting about it for me is it gives paladins who are playing those specs time in current content to actually experience what that feels like as opposed to going, okay, here's a new chunk of content with a new raid or a new dungeon or a different mythic plus rotation, et cetera, with a new season launch and your class has been reworked. Go have fun. 
and there's like this massive learning right. curve that they have to undertake, right? Whereas in this case, you already know the content, you know the Mythic Plus dungeons, you know how the affixes affect them, you know what raid you're doing, you know how the bosses work, and you're just having to figure out your, you know, how your class plays again, as opposed to doing two things or three things or four things at the same time, which I think is much better for player experience. So I'm, I love seeing this. It's great change. Great, great time to do the change, should I say. Okay, another hotfix that came in. They added ancient bats and ancient tigers to Zul Garub as a new source of primal bat leather and tiger leather. Pardon me. Um, and uh, that means that people who are really running low on those particular materials can go and get them a lot easier, which I think will be nice for a lot of players. Uh, they yeah, also. I, don't, oh, I mean, I, is that for is that for old uh, for old profession mass? It must be right. Yeah, because yeah. they wouldn't want you to go to Zul Group for new stuff. So I guess if there's something in particular that you need to make from an old recipe, then yeah, once the patch comes out, you'll have a spot to go to go get that. Yeah. Well, Zul Group's just cool. It's nice to have a reason to go there. I guess. Yeah, actually, I, it's very nostalgic for me to go there whenever I do. It's incredibly nostalgic. <laughs> I spent so much time in there when it was on a two day a week reset. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> all right. The other thing that came in is we're starting to see the very first major changes to the chat function inside of World of Warcraft, the thing that I've been calling for the most. Um, these aren't the changes I'm looking for, but they're good changes that I'm excited to see. And it means they're looking at an area of the UI, a box on the UI, that I want them to look a lot closer at. <laughs> so uh, what we're getting is real-time chat moderation, where whispers that can contain harassing chat sent to you from a player who are not on your friends list will now be hidden. Uh, you're going to get an alert that pops up saying, hey, you got a message that uh, you may, you know, that has been blocked because of some disruptive content. You, you might not want to look at it. If you want to look at, at it, you can reveal it to see what it said. Uh, and then, of course, you'll have the option to report players afterwards. So this is a great feature in general for moderation, something that already exists in Twitch and a bunch of other places where someone types a message that's a little bit suspect. Uh, it can be auto-blocked, and then a moderator has to, like, say, yes, this message can go through so everyone else can see it. Inside this case, it arrives in and is automatically, you know, hidden, and then you have to click, yes, I want to actually see this. And it's the, the important part about all of this is it's only for people who are not on your friends list. So if your friend and you are a little saucy in your chat when you normally talk to each other, you're not always getting your chat blocked and having to click on it all the time, which would be very irritating for a lot of people, and they'd want this turned off immediately or a way to turn it off immediately. Um, in this case, it's only people who are not on your friends list. So it's that unwarranted slam by someone inside of, after running a dungeon with them or whatever it is, right? Like those things will be filtered out, which will be really nice to see. So I'm, I'm excited to see that. And of course, reporting player is always a good option. Uh, so cool feature. Yeah, this is great. I mean, I, we've talked a lot about how WoW's moderation tools are outdated. WoW's chat is outdated. This is, you know, updates to both of those things at the same time. I think it's good. Um, I feel like the only way you would be upset about this is if you are a chat troll and now it's harder for you to insult people that you don't even actually know. So I feel like that's good. I feel like you shouldn't be able to do that. And if you are mad about this, then you deserve to be because <laughs> like this is just not, it's not a cool thing to do to people mm -hmm. in the game. So mm -hmm. don't do it. You know, just, if you have a tense interaction with somebody, try to be polite, try to ignore them, whatever. But like, you know, now at least the, the game is like on your side to prevent this from like happening to you as much as it can. Right. So, um, that's cool. I, I, I want, I want to see more stuff like this. I want to see more updates to chat, more tools, um, and anything they can do, you know, around moderation, just improving the, the social experience for players is a huge win for the game. Yeah. So the other thing they added to chat is a, uh, a little tag, it actually specifies on the actual chat bar which language you're communicating in, which I think is important because they're adding another language that you're going to learn how to speak. Um, and it's something that I think gets used so in often of clicking on the little like, you know, chat bubble that you have there and then picking your language of what you're going to talk in and then speaking that language. And other people who don't speak that language, so people who aren't night elves, for example, would just see you speaking in the night elf language and wouldn't understand what you're saying. But other night elves will be able to understand what you're saying. It's a really cool RP sort of aspect to the game, which makes a lot of sense as a, you know, MMORPG, uh, that they'd have something like that. So just making that, and I'm hoping what this means is the tag is actually an area you can click and change which language you're speaking in right on the actual chat bar, um, which would make it much easier to access and then people will be more likely to use it. Because it's a really cool feature about the game and it really makes the game feel more alive. So 
if you're not typing in common or orcish, I don't know why they specified orcish as being the other one uh, as opposed to just saying just common. But anyways, if you're not typing in common or orcish, uh, these are uh, um, maybe orcish. Is orcish just the the common language of horde? Is that what they right? Refer yeah, to common common yeah. like the the, the stormwind language, okay. and orcish is the orgrimmar language. Right. So yeah, it, this used to be like used to this just was be a thing that was in in the game like you know at, at, at launch, launch was at like launch. okay you have your language proficiency so yeah. if you play you know if you play a uh like a night elf then you have darnassian and common language proficiencies and you could like switch your language to darnassian yeah. so if you just wanted to talk to other night elf tunes and then other races couldn't see what you were couldn't understand what you were saying yeah it really never ended up having like a place in the game in any really significant way it's um, of role playing yeah there wasn't really yeah role there. playing sure but like for for the gameplay itself it's like cutting off who you can communicate with isn't actually advantageous in playing the game so it kind of never really caught on for for the actual gameplay but um i don't know yeah, there, I, there were definitely I, times that i talked shade inside rain inside Darnassia <laughs> and other people didn't know what i was doing right that, that happened you know you did a little <laughs> you get a little saucy and your your mm -hmm. you know say chat and sort of a nod to all the other you know, yeah. night elves out there that's true. Yeah, I mean, you could do that, but other than that, yeah, it just never really, it never really found a niche for some actual purpose, you know. But um, yeah, I guess this is like you mentioned. This is probably um, sort of part of the thing with the furball coming in, yeah. just to make it make it clear like what you're supposed to be doing, or maybe a reason why you can't understand what somebody's saying or something. Like, well, I, I think just more throw so it in the in the chat bar. I think more so it's also to people who forget that they're typing in a certain language. I think is the other big part. So you're trying to talk inside, you know, your party chat or whatever, and right. you forget that you're set to a different language, and suddenly no one can understand what you're saying, and you're wondering why no one can understand what you're saying for this entire time when you've been saying things. That's that's you've why you've been growling. Yeah. You're just you're exactly. just growling like a furball exactly the, whole time the entire time. And nobody, yep. yeah, just you take you, that all those raid strat instructions for nothing. Everyone's got their Chewbacca, you know, translator turned on to try and understand what you're saying as you're trying to speak to them. Um, yeah, it's uh, I don't know. I, I I love the idea of it. Um, I, I suddenly have an urge to just like be inside groups and start talking shade about NPCs, but inside another language that only one other person could understand so that you can have this like unique moment of joking around about Alex Straza or something, um, inside a, you know, Darnassian language. But yeah, anyways. Um, yeah. I mean, that's a thing the game does let you do. It's yeah. just, we never do it. Just we never do it. So yeah, it's another thing that, you know, you could, you could check out doing if you want. So yeah, I'm glad they're doing this and I hope it, I hope it does actually make it easier to take advantage of the, the other languages because they are fun to use. Okay, we have a big old blog post from Mr. Brian Halinka, and this is about the season one rated PvP rating discussion that's been going on. Jason, you want to dive a little bit into this? Just get us started on it. Yeah, I, I mean, basically, you know, we're, we're at the point now where we're sort of thinking about end of season stuff, right? Like we have some time to go this season, but, you know, Conquest is uncapped. We've We've had the season up for, what, 11 weeks now or whatever. Um, and I, you know, that's sort of what's on the horizon is, is end of season. Right. So, um, Brian put out a post to sort of dig into how rating is calculated and how that changes over the course of the season and sort of what is happening in the game right now at this point in the season. And also, setting some expectations or giving like a bit of a preview as to kind of what the plan is for the next season. So that, that's sort of the topic at hand here is, you know, how, how rating calculations are working and, and what their plan is over the next, you know, for the duration of this season and, and into uh, season two. Yeah, I'm, uh, I think it's important to have these posts that lay out what's going to be coming up and what's going to be happening uh, with the next season. And I think it's important that they address the things that happened in the previous season that they want to improve on or change. And so it's nice to actually get these, in my opinion, so far ahead of the next season, <laughs> because as the sort of title of this goes, it's a PVP rating discussion, which means they expect players to reply to this. They expect players to give feedback. They expect, expect things to happen uh, with this post that are actually going to help people out um, in the future with the, the upcoming seasons. Um, so yeah, they, uh, they decided to go to Dragonflight Season 1, uh, that sort of talked a bit about it. Um, something they decided to do for Dragonflight Season 1 was to delay the start of inflation until week 10. Uh, we didn't feel that inflation was necessary during the early season when players are, uh, playing to earn conquest 
to complete their gear sets. Chasing titles at the end of the season uh, rewards isn't entirely relevant yet. But now at week 10, players will be completing their conquest sets, so inflation will kick in at 20 rating per week to help dislodge pl uh, people from the top ladder uh, and reach whatever their seasonal goal might be. Since we're starting it later in the season at this aggressive rate, we won't reach ratings that are uh, as highly inflated. In retrospect, we think this delay was too long and we're considering uh, starting it earlier in the future, perhaps at a reduced rate. So overall in general, um, not only acknowledging that, hey, this is why we waited in 10 weeks to do inflation, but also, hey, we think we waited too long to do inflation on the ratings for people inside PvP. I think it's great just to see them acknowledge things like this inside posts. I just like going through it and sort of getting the headspace on it. I know it's very PvP heavy and PvP related, so not everyone's going to be curious or interested in this, and not everyone is actually pushing to actually have that title rank, you know, for a PvP season. So they might not care as much about it. So I don't, I don't want to like digest and chew apart this entire post, but we did want to point out this post that it exists. It's a blog post. You can check it out and get it on this conversation because it's very cool to uh, to see what people have to say about PvP, especially when the devs get involved and have a discussion like this going. So definitely a post that's worth checking out. Yeah, this just sounds like ratings are going to be a bit more uh, volatile here in the in the tail end or the second half of season one. So. Um, it might make it a bit easier if you're if you're pushing for you know certain things to kind of get caught up on or or what have you, and it sounds like yeah, next season you know they want they want to have an earlier but more gentle ramp when once they're sort of past the uh, you know the the ladder squatters phase where the the highest skill players are sort of done with the whole system and um, you know other players still have goals to meet so. It sounds pretty good to me. I mean, the the logic, the reasoning makes sense. It's just you never really know how this stuff is going to play out in practice and how players are going to feel about it. So um, I think it's definitely a, a smart thing to have the conversation with the players and sort of explain the intent and, and lay out the plan. I, I think those are the things players really appreciate versus having a blue post two weeks before the end of the season about something that people are not expecting. And then you have a yep. big problem, right? Yep. Like this is the, what this is probably a better way to do it. Yeah. They, they talk about how they feel PVP seasons have three different stages, the early season, the mid season and the end of season. And the early season being that time where people are like, I just want conquest to make, to get gear. That's all I'm doing. I was one of those people. Like I, I didn't PVP all throughout the tail end of Shadowlands. I PVP a bit. But a lot of it is front-loaded. There's so many more players who do PvP in that early season because they just want to get the gear. That's what they're that, that's what they're in there for. And then the mid-season is when most people have finished their tier sets and they're gearing up but trying out different classes. So people are kind of experimenting, seeing what they like, seeing where the feel is. And that end of season is when people who are still sticking around are like, I am pushing for milestones and titles. This is what I want to get. And so, you know, sort of acknowledging that we're hitting that mid-season point. We finish the early season point. So we're, we're, they're seeing the shift happen and they're wanting to start the discussion of what this is going to look like and talk a bit about how that early season went and what they're looking at doing in the future. So I, 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 don't know, I, I just dig when the devs actually get out there and go, hey, this is what we're up to. This is what we're hoping for. This is what we want to have happen. This is what we like about this uh, because it's nice to actually explore those things. So yeah, thank you very much, Brian, for that. And if you guys want to check it out, obviously link to it's going to be in the show notes. All right, uh, we've reached that time of the show where I like to give a shout out to all of our patrons. Uh, it's really about taking the time right now to thank some people who really help us out in a really big way, but also all of our patrons for contributing and listening and helping to the show. Uh, so today I'm going to give a shout out to Arajian, Celian, Kapawi, Max, Mimble the Mighty, Nick, Shorl, Viper14, and Zaleus. Thank you. You make the show better. You guys help improve all the content that we create as well as all of our patrons. Thank you so much for supporting the show. Uh, our Patreon is over at patreon.com slash the starting zone. Our newest patron this week is Tim, Tim O.R. Thank you so much for supporting the show. Um, we still don't have major plans for what we're going to be doing in 2023 when it comes to patron events, but there did the discussion did get going inside Discord this past week, which was great. People making suggestions around things like, hey, maybe we do achievement runs through old raids. Um, maybe we do a, uh, a night where we sort of all get on and do, uh, time walking together or something of that sort. Um, so there was neat to see some of the suggestions start coming through. So we really appreciate that. Uh, we just need to sort of nail down what that's going to look like schedule wise. And since we do have a lot of listeners who participate in EU as well as outside of, uh, the NA realms, making sure there's something for them to sort of jump in on as well. Uh, 
And that could mean something like Jackbox games or, you know, so there, there's um, Gardic Phone, which is a nice drawing game that a lot of people play. There's a lot of outside stuff where it could just be us hanging out in Discord, talking with you, answering questions as we go, but playing a game at the same time might be a lot of fun to do. So we're still exploring some of those options. But in general, thank you very much to all of our patrons. Thank you so much to the ones I listed off as well for the extra support you all give. Uh, you guys are fantastic. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, patrons, for all the support and for helping us make the show the best it can be. It really means a lot and it helps us keep the show on track and 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 deliver the product that you expect and, and that we want to be able to deliver to you. So uh, thank you for all the support. Yeah. Another way to support the show is to leave us a five-star review. Uh, go on to your iTunes, your Apple Podcasts, leave us the five stars. They really help us out. And we read them here on the show. This one comes in from Kyle Swiss in the U.S., uh, entitled The Best Wow Podcast Around. It says, love these guys. Starting list, started listening about a year ago and uh, best way to keep up with the game in a timely manner. So thank you so much, Kyle, for leaving us the five star. It means a lot to us. And, uh, you know, if anyone else is looking to leave us some five stars, we'll get them on the next episode. So always appreciated. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time to write in. Always great to hear from you. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you taking the time. And uh, man, we've gotten like so many reviews over the last uh, few years I don't, I don't i think we're getting, getting close to like a thousand aren't we so um i'd uh, love to see them and i'd love to hear from you guys so so thanks everybody for writing in yeah it means a lot all right that wraps up episode 566 of the starting zone i know it's a bit of a shorter one but it's because no major big time stuff was happening this past week and it means you can digest this just a little bit faster and a little bit easier and we'll uh obviously be back with more news next week and so if you want to go to show notes for this episode or leave us a comment on the show, you can go over to thestartingzone.com, the official website for the Starting Zone podcast. If you want to contact the show and leave us your feedback or ask a question, you can email us at thestartingzone at gmail.com. These are the type of episodes where we fit those emails in, by the way, uh, when we have those kicking in. We emptied our mailbag a little while back. And uh, so if you have more questions and whatnot, feel free to write in. And then we'll be able to toss them in at the end of shows like this and, uh, you know, round out that hour and a half mark, hour and 15 minute mark that we're looking for um, on our regular episodes. If you want to give us your feedback or ask a question, you can also reach out to us on Discord or on Twitter. Uh, so if you go to startingzone.com slash Discord, you can hit us up there uh, or you can ask us on Twitter. Um, obviously, the write-in ones to Gmail are ones that we kind of like put into the mailbag and hang on to and fill in and answer a little bit more fully on the show. But we'll always hit people up on Discord or Twitter if they're asking us something there. I know uh, Jason was sharing out that WeCora and continues to that uh, was mentioned on the show a little while back for people who are interested in that and really appreciated that. So that's great. Uh, if you want to get your hands on some TSE gear, you can find that over at Tee Public. That's teepublic.com slash stores slash the starting zone. And you can get all the designs on shirts and mugs and stickers. And Jason, where can folks find you on the internet? Best place to find me, as always, is over on Twitter. You can find me over there at Shieldwald. And uh, you can also find me streaming WoW over on twitch.tv slash Shieldwald. Occasionally on youtube.com slash Shieldwald as well. So check out those channels. Streams are Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Sundays. 7 30 eastern and then we go until we kind of run out of important stuff to do i might try i don't know my my upstream has been really wonky lately and even just getting out to twitch has been tough i don't know what's going on it's gonna be my isp so um i might try to fire them both up tonight since um we're gonna be doing you know reclears and farm content so we'll, we'll see but yeah check out the streams always a good time and um doing you know heroic and mythic raid doing keystones and all that stuff yeah, you can try to find me. You can find me over on Twitter at Spencer underscore Downey, over on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Spencer HD, or on YouTube at youtube.com slash at Spencer HD. And with that, for Jason and myself, we want to say thanks for listening and jobs done. <laughs>